forward that we can pass here, and I would urge all my colleagues in the House to support this motion to instruct, and I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. Well, I thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania. He's a, a good friend and a colleague and a, an honest broker on things. I, I agree. We're getting into this, and I, I agree with the gentleman on the, the categorically excluded bridges. Ninety-six percent are now, so we can decide now do we want to do we want to bog down on that last 4% or do we want to get a bill forward? So I think there's agreement here. I think we're in a clear-cut case of if, if the perfect gets in the way of the good, the American public uh, pay for that. But I appreciate his support on this. I appreciate his desire to get a bill done. And I, I think it's been, uh, it's been obvious that he wants this transportation bill done. So I thank the gentleman. With that, I yield the time to uh, the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. DeFazio, for three minutes. The gentleman from uh, Oregon is recognized for three minutes. Uh, I, thank, uh, I thank the gentleman for yielding time. Uh, since uh, the founding of our nation, uh, there has been bipartisan agreement on the need for the federal government to play a strong role in interconnecting uh, the states uh, of our country. It was George Washington who said, the only binding cement and no otherwise to be affected, but by opening such communications as will make it easier and cheaper for them to bring the product of their labor to our markets. And that's relevant today. I'll address that in a moment. And the second quote, which is relevant to the dispute today, is we're either a united people under one head for federal purposes, or we are 13 independent sovereignties eternally con counteracting each other. This is the need. The gentleman knows this photo well. There are more than 70,000 bridges that are structurally deficient in this country, load limited. Uh, there are others, another 70 or so thousand that are functionally obsolete uh, or need substantial repair. 150,000 bridges. 40% of the pavement on the national highway system doesn't just need an overlay, it needs to be dug up. It needs underlayment and restructuring. And a $70 billion backlog on our transit systems. We are actually killing people because we aren't investing in our infrastructure, let alone losing the opportunities for millions of jobs and economic competitiveness and more fuel efficiency. People died right here in Washington, D.C. on the metro because they're running cars that don't work anymore in the middle of trains surrounded by cars that are supposed to work and help the ones that don't work. Uh, people died here because this bridge collapsed. We need to make these investments. And with the Made in America requirements, in the transportation uh, portions of our government, which are the strongest, and we hope to make even stronger in this bill uh, with working with the Republican side of the aisle here, uh, we could put millions to work, not just construction workers who certainly need the jobs, but also small businesses that supply, fabrication firms, manufacturing firms, steel manufacturers, and others across the board would be put to work rebuilding our infrastructure. What's the problem? Here's the problem, the second thing that George Washington talked about, saying that we're either united or we're going to be internally counteracting one another. There are, unfortunately, a substantial number of Republicans in their conference which have blocked movement on a bill because they don't believe, unlike George Washington, that the federal government has a role to play in coordinating a national transportation system. They want to devolve to the states. They want to go back to the good old days before Dwight David Eisenhower brought us into the modern era with a national highway system. Here's the good old days. That's the brand spanking new Kansas Turnpike. Oops. It ends in Amos Schweitzer's field. That's the Oklahoma state line. Do you have one additional minute? To the gentleman. That's the, that's the Oklahoma state line. Oklahoma had promised to build their section, but they couldn't because they had a funding dispute, and they didn't until the Eisenhower bill passed, and we had federal aid to help Oklahoma build their section. Now, we should go back to those good old days, but there are some 80-odd members of the Republican conference who are opposing a well-funded, longer-term bill because this is their belief. These were better days for the United States of America. Well, I tell you what, we can do a bill, and we could do a bill that does accommodate some of the concerns on the Republican side of the aisle with a serious conference over the next few days with a will just to get it done, put America back to work, and rebuild our infrastructure. And you're going to have to have, unfortunately, because of your devolutionists, some Democratic votes to pass it. 
Let's go back to the days of Denny Hastert. A majority of the majority need to vote for a bill. But it doesn't have to be passed only with Republican votes. We're not going to ever get a bill done if it's done on a partisan basis. I thank the gentleman. I reserve the balance of my time, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee. Mr. Speaker, at this time I yield three minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Sutherland, a very active member of our committee. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. I'd like to thank uh, the gentleman from Tennessee for yielding time. You know, when, uh, as, a, as a new member of this body, it was, uh, it was quite an honor to be appointed a conferee to go to conference. Uh, those who who, who are on, in a part of this body recognize that, that uh, it's usually something that obviously senior members uh, are appointed to. It was a great uh, honor, and, and, it, and it still is, even though we have yet to, uh, uh, to have a product that uh, we can vote upon. You can imagine uh, my disappointment when, after attending five working group meetings, uh, I did not have a single individual to look at on the other side of the table representing the other body. You see, when the American people sent us here, I believe they sent us here to change the way we do business. And I'm pleased that, um, that we were sent to be involved uh, in those five meetings. You know, I keep hearing oftentimes in the, in the media how, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, that, that uh, it is, it is the, the Republican side that aren't perhaps interested in a bill. But I would say, if that were true, then why did I attend five working group meetings only to have no counterpart on the other side of the table? We recognize not just words, we recognize actions. And I think the American people are so tired of words. And I think that they would be terribly disappointed if they knew that their elected members did not even attend meetings. And if they did not attend these working group meetings, then how could they be serious and expecting us to believe that they're interested in a bill. I think that we trample on their trust when we don't do the people's work. It was terribly, terribly disappointing. I want the reforms. I believe they're important. I believe that if we can build a bridge like I-35 through Minnesota, we can rebuild it in 437 days. I think it makes sense to include streamlining provisions in this bill that say that every project around the country is just as important as I-35. And so therefore, we need to build all bridges back to their original state without having to go through long, laborious, expensive environmental impact studies if we're rebuilding that bridge back or repaving that road back on the original footprint. I think that makes sense. And I think the American people want us to do their work. They want us to create a bill of value and a bill that is paid for and I think that what we have voted upon and the reforms that we have asked to be considered, not only have they not been answered or, or, or even addressed, but we haven't even had the opportunity to even look at one of our counterparts on the other side of the aisle and speak to them at conference. It's terribly disappointing. And with that, I rise uh, in support, in support of this motion to instruct, because I believe that we need to have members come, and we need to debate, and we need to do the people's business. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota. I thank the gentleman for his support. At this time, I'd like to yield two minutes to a senior member of the Transportation Committee, Mr. Bishop from New York. The gentleman from New York is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my friend from Minnesota for, for yielding. Uh, I rise in support of the motion to instruct conferees. Now, let me just start by, by just making clear uh, that this issue of categorical exclusion is one that's important for us to all recognize. The 35W bridge, uh, the rebuild, was subject to a categorical, categorical exclusion, so it was not held up. And again, I will repeat what my friend from Minnesota said, 96% of the projects that go forward with highway bill funding are subject to a categorical exclusion. And we really have to ask ourselves if we're going to continue to allow uh, unemployment in the construction industry at 35 percent for 4 percent of the projects that are constructed under the highway bill. 
This motion would direct conferees to adopt a final conference report no later than this Friday, June 22nd. In fact, June 22nd represents the 100th day since the Senate passed MAP 21 with an overwhelming bipartisan majority of 7422. It's fully paid for and it will save or create an estimated 3 million jobs. In fact, in my state alone, at least 115,000 jobs will be saved or created if we can get either a successful conference report or the passage of MAP 21. It's been 126 days since the House Rules Committee began considering H.R. 7 for, for floor consideration, which faltered soon thereafter when my Republican colleagues could not gain consensus within their own caucus and the bill died. It's now been 62 days since the House passed a shell bill to allow conference negotiations to begin. Finally, and most importantly, we are a mere six legislative days away from the expiration of our highway programs when the current 90-day extension expires on June 30th. During this entire time, one fact has been a constant, that the men and women of our construction industry continue to suffer with one of the highest rates of unemployment for any industry. We continue to lack the certainty that a multi-year highway bill would provide. It would provide states the ability to plan and initiate projects to put people back to work and begin the much needed improvements to our roadways, bridges and transit systems desperately need. Have another minute? Yes. I yield another minute, Mr. Speaker. You can recognize for one minute. Thank you. I applaud my Senate colleagues who put aside partisan politics to advance a bipartisan bill. To their credit, the Senate put forward that which they could agree on and set aside to a later date that which, on which they could not agree. It was a sensible and successful strategy. With Senate Democrats, Senate Republicans, House Democrats and the White House all supporting MAP 21, it is clear that if we can just get the House Republicans on board, we can get a bill. And that's what we need to do. We can get a bill because a temporary extension, yet another, is not a strategy that works. A temporary extension is not the answer. We will soon exhaust the trust fund. States and municipalities will not have the certainty they need to plan. Thus, construction companies will not be able to hire, and we will lose yet another construction season. A temporary extension is not the answer. Passing a conference report by June 30th or passing MAP 21 is the answer. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Tennessee. Mr. Speaker, at this time I yield three minutes to the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lankford, who has been one of our lead negotiators on uh, trying to come up with a transportation bill in our conference. Gentleman three minutes. Oklahoma is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think my colleague from Tennessee. It, it is interesting for me to be able to hear the indignation and in saying we've got to get this bill done. It's important that it gets resolved. And I would have to say I completely agree with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. This is a very important bill. Every person who gets in a vehicle, gets in a bus, gets in a truck, or has any piece or item in their home that's delivered by truck, train, uh, whatever it may be, is all affected by this. So it's very important. But just a quick history lesson. When I arrived here in January of last year, we were on extension number six because the previous highway bill expired in 2009. And when Democrats had the House and the Senate and the presidency, and they loaded their bill up with earmarks to get it passed. They did not get a bill passed. So it's interesting to hear the, the conversation about, well, if Republicans in the House could, could get this resolved, then we'd get this settled, when in reality, there are a lot of technical details that better be right, that even when Democrats had the House, the Senate, and the presidency for two years could not get this bill done, even with all the earmarks. This is a different day. We're trying to work together between the House and the Senate. One body doesn't pass a bill and the other body just says, I tell you what, you passed it, we'll just go ahead and do that. If so, I would love for the Senate to take up many of the bills that we passed in the House and just have the Senate go ahead and pass those. But this has to be a bicameral agreement. We're not going to do this with earmarks. That's a big difference. In the past, these bills had thousands upon thousands of earmarks and we have determined no more. We're not going to do it that way. We have to live within a budget, and we have to be able to help a few things work a lot better than they have in the past. Major highways right now take about 15 years in construction. We think that's way too long. The first seven years of that is just in permitting and process and in this repetitive process that we have with the federal government with this linear permitting. We just want to be able to stack those permits up, allow people to be able to take the first step on it, still have all the same environmental reviews, but do it in a way that's faster and is more streamlined. It saves time, it saves money, 
it actually builds those roads a lot faster than waiting all of this time. I can tell you many people in Oklahoma stare at the engineering work on both sides of the road and hear about new construction that's happening, but they hear about it and hear about it and hear about it and hear about it before the dirt ever gets turned. We want to try to get these, these uh, road projects started and completed. We want to allow road money to actually be used for roads. Now, I know that's a crazy idea, but we'd like highway money to be used for highways. We'd like to stay within budget. And we'd like the states to be able to have the flexibility to spend their money, remembering it's their money, not Washington, D.C.'s money. That 18.4 cents that came out of that state is going back into that state in gas tax. We want the individuals that actually paid that gas tax to be able to help resolve how that's going to best be used. If they have bridges that are coming down, let's fix bridges. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with that, I would like to yield uh, two minutes to my colleague, uh, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. I thank the gentleman from. Uh, the gentlelady is recognized for. How much time, sir? Two minutes, Mr. Speaker. The gentlelady is recognized for two minutes. I thank the speaker, uh, and I thank the gentleman from Minnesota and manager, uh, and my friends on the other side of the aisle. This is an important crucial motion to instruct. Crucial is the word. And I thank the gentleman for recognizing that while we are here, others are languishing. Bridges are languishing. Highways are languishing. Ports and even our mass transit concerns are languishing because we have not moved forward. One, two, three, four, five. I think we're up to five extensions the last five to seven years, if my counting is correct. But most importantly, let me congratulate members from both sides of the aisles that have come forward to support the gentleman's motion to instruct, which evidences how crucial this motion is and how we need to move beyond the many, many conference calls that I know that those conferees who are in are getting from so many interest groups and indicate that we need to move forward and bring a report forward that will not stop us from continuing to negotiate on some of the many sidebar issues. But as we languish, we're losing jobs. As we languish, Americans are unemployed. As we languish, bridges continue to crumble. And I remember our good friend, Chairman Overstar, who taught us a few years ago that if you pass a transportation and infrastructure bill, you put America back to work. Tragically, as he was speaking some years ago, tragically, one of his own bridges in that area had a very devastating impact uh, in the fracturing of that bridge. We don't want to see that anymore. We want to be able to see people going to work. And so I simply would ask that this motion to instruct is followed. Bring to the floor in a conference report not later than June 22nd, 2012, the ability to pass this legislation. Can I get 30 seconds? 30 seconds to the gentleman. Additional 30 seconds. The gentleman is recognized. I thank the gentleman. Bring to the floor this conference report, put to work people in Texas, fix bridges and put to work people in Minnesota, Virginia, New York, across the nation, south, north, east, and west, and begin to solve separate difficult problems, if I might say, on the side. I want to see our workers working, many of our friends in the IBEW and building trades and many other supporting unions for the machinists and others working. I believe this is a bipartisan message. Let's do it now. I yield back. Gentlemen, time has expired. Gentleman from Tennessee. Mr. Speaker, at this time I yield three minutes to the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Kovac, a very important uh, member of our conference. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized for three minutes. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I couldn't agree more with my colleague from Minnesota, and I rise in support of his motion to instruct. We will continue to stand ready to negotiate with the Senate. As a conferee, I have partaken in some of these meetings myself and have negotiated in good faith with Senate staff. Unfortunately, no senators. The Highway Trust Fund is bankrupt, and the federal highway program is in need of serious reform. Congressman Walls is quite correct in that we cannot continue to kick this can down the road. And I believe the Conferee House positions are fair and practical. 
Allowing states the flexibility in order to address their specific transportation needs just makes sense. We have a $15.7 trillion debt. 46 percent of our debt is foreign owned. 30 percent owned by one country, China. We do not have the luxury, as the Senate bill requires, to spend money on things like wildflowers and at the same time the trust fund is bankrupt. And as Mr. Walls and Mr. DeFazio points out, bridges are in disrepair and roads are crumbling. We need to get our priorities in order. The House bill consolidates and eliminates programs as opposed to creating $3 billion a year and increasing new programs like the Senate bill. This is not extreme, it's fiscally responsible. The 293 bipartisan House members voted to approve the Keystone Pipeline, a fair and practical approach to helping lowering gas prices at the pump and creating tens of thousands of jobs without hurting the environment. Finally, the House positions of streamlining and significantly reducing the times it takes without harming the environment to build major road projects in this country is practical position. Fifteen years to permit, design, and build is not. The Senate steadfastly refuses to cut any bureaucratic red tape that is associated with building a highway or bridge. We need to stop paying for construction jobs from being endlessly tied up. If the Senate is serious as we are to get this done early next week, I hope that they engage a good faith in a bicameral fashion. I thank my colleague from Minnesota again for bringing this up. This is a very important position, and I support his motion to re-instruct, and I urge my colleagues to do so as well, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Minnesota. I thank the gentleman for his support. At this time, I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky. Gentlelady from Illinois is recognized for... For two minutes, two Mr. Minutes. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the House Republicans are doing nothing short of sabotaging our economy and, and jeopardizing millions of jobs by refusing to pass a long-term, well-funded transportation bill like the bipartisan Senate bill. Seventy-four senators, including 22 Republicans, voted in favor of S-1813, MAP-21. And at one point, the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, expressed his support for the bipartisan Senate bill. It is time for us to pass that legislation. The unemployment rate in the construction industry remains nearly triple the national average. Construction workers, engineers, architects, managers, contractors, and developers tell me that another short-term extension will not bring enough certainty to the industry. In Illinois, my state, the failure to pass a long-term transportation extension at the peak of the construction season has kept many unemployed and put thousands of other jobs at risk. Our states, our localities, our business owners, our workers deserve better. MAP 21 is the single largest jobs bill passed by either body in this 112th Congress. In my home state of Illinois alone, MAP 21 will save or create 70,000 jobs. Nationwide, the bill will save or create nearly 2 million jobs and spur one million additional jobs through the leveraging of transit funds. I'm a strong supporter of MAP 21, and we should send it to the President's desk this week. I can't support, and our workers can't support, another short-term extension that will leave thousands of Illinois jobs hanging in the balance. We need to move forward with legislation that, that does more than kick the can down the road, and I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Gentleman from Tennessee. Mr. Speaker, at this time I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Indiana, Dr. Bouchon, who has been a very lead negotiator for our, on our conference committee for the Republican side. Two gentleman, minutes. Gentleman from Indiana is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank Mr. Walls for bringing. I'd like to thank Mr. Walls for bringing this to the floor. I believe that we all can agree we must pass a long-term highway bill. In my home state of Indiana, Interstate 69 is being constructed through my district, connecting my district to our state's capital. When I return home, return home every weekend, I see how important federal dollars are to the construction industry and how necessary infrastructure is to the economic development of our cities and towns. As a member of the Conference Committee for the Highway Bill, I have personally been involved in this process. My House colleagues and I have attended several negotiation sessions 
and discuss this legislation at length with the Senate staff. I wish our friends in the Senate were as involved in the process because we could have resolved many of these issues weeks ago. I think my friends on the other side of the aisle in this body here of the House seem to forget that we don't just rubber stamp Senate bills and they don't rubber stamp ours. If that was the case, they'd take up the 30 House passed job creating bills that we've sent over to them in the last year. Nobody is more committed to this legislation than members of the House on the Republican side. We want to streamline the project delivery process, eliminate duplicative programs, give more power back to the states, and stretch our limited dollars further. These are proposals that every member of this body should support. We need a long-term reauthorization that will provide certainty to our nation's job creators. I support this motion, and I look forward to completion of this conference. Thank you. I yield back. Jim yields back. Jim from Minnesota. I thank the gentleman for his support and his work on this. At this time, I'd like to yield three minutes to my friend and colleague from California, Mr. Garamendi. Jim from California is recognized for three minutes. I want to thank the uh, gentleman from Minnesota for yielding time for me to discuss this. Uh, during this uh, approximate one hour of debate, it pays to listen to what has actually been said. What's been said by my Republican colleagues is it's our way or no highway. We're going to have our way or no highway. What is their way? What is it that the Republicans are demanding? Get past the nice rhetoric and look at the detail underlying the words. Eliminate duplication. Hmm? What does that mean? Well, it basically means eliminating the environmental laws. Oh, we don't need them. The states can take care of it. I think not. They want to focus on highways. Well, we all do. But what does that mean? It means that they want to eliminate the public transportation portion of this legislation. Okay, so no buses, no trains, no light rail funding. Get into the details about what is actually being demanded by our Republican colleagues, and you begin to say, well, wait a minute. I think we can understand why there's not been progress here. We need to really move forward. Some 60,000 construction workers have lost their jobs in the last five months as our Republican colleagues have laid out their demands, which they have essentially said are non-negotiable. Their way or no highway. They're holding this country hostage. They're holding the construction industry hostage so that they can have their way. Understand what their way means. No public transportation programs. Oh, we'll repair bridges and we'll do highways. And that's good. But there's more to it than this. No bike paths. No safety for work for men and women that were walking along our highways. That's their way. That's not what America's way needs to be. We need to pass a bill. We can no longer afford. Two million people want to go to work. Yes, they agree with Mr. Walsh's proposal to get this thing done. But what they're really saying is get it done our way or there will be no highway. The Senate has passed a bill. 74 Democrats and Republicans agreed to it. Let's get it done. If you can get it your way in the next three days, fine. Otherwise, give us the Senate bill and let's put men and women to work here in this country. We cannot afford any more layoffs in the construction industry. We can no longer afford to wait. A two-year bill is essential. I yield back. General Reserve, the gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I have uh, no additional speakers on our side, so I will uh, close for our side by saying just a couple of things. Uh, one is the uh, last highway bill uh, that passed with only eight dissenting votes that's been mentioned here a couple of times tonight was passed uh, when Republicans were in control of the Congress. And so I think that shows very clearly that uh, the overwhelming majority of Republicans in the Congress uh, support highway bills, and we want to do one this year. One of the, one of the main sticking points for us, and one of the problems is, is that uh, in my almost quarter century uh, in this body, 
uh, we've been talking about and giving lip service to environmental streamlining all through those years, but we really never have accomplished anything. And so you've heard it said several times tonight, the Federal Highway Administration says the average highway project, and these are not transcontinental roads, it takes 15 years to build them. When all these other developed nations are doing these projects in a third or half the time that we are, we have got to do more with less during this time of budgetary constraints. We want to do these things because these are jobs that can't be outsourced to foreign countries. They are jobs that uh, will be done here. They're important to this economy. The Republicans uh, uh, believe that there is an important uh, and legitimate role for the federal government in transportation projects. People in California use the airports in Texas and vice versa. People in uh, New York sometimes drink the water in Florida and vice versa. People in Ohio sometimes drive on the highways in Tennessee and vice versa. All people uh, benefit from lower prices uh, when our ports uh, operate efficiently. So all of the things that we deal with on the, in the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, Republicans believe in them and they want to, to see uh, a, a good, uh, legitimate, but not dictatorial federal role in those projects. We believe that, that the role of the states is very important and we believe that the role of the local governments and the local people is, is pro should be paramount because they know the needs of their states better than almost, in their localities better than almost anyone. But we are supportive of uh, the gentleman from Minnesota. We're supportive of his motion to instruct because it's our goal is the same as his. We want to produce a good, conservative, reasonable uh, transportation bill uh, for this nation and we want to do it sooner rather than later. We would, we would like to do it to, uh, in, in, within the next few days, but before we can do that, the, Senate, the other body does not control this process. They have to take into consideration what the uh, House wants as well, and that's what we're talking about. So with that, uh, we support the motion to instruct by the gentleman from Minnesota, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota to close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I would like to, uh, to thank the gentleman from Tennessee, uh, a, a leader on this. He has the institutional experience and knowledge and uh, always gracious. And, uh, and I would have to say, uh, you're going to find a lot of agreement from me on this. I, I certainly think that's the case. The American public deserves better. I think they deserve a debate like they're seeing tonight. They see a sense of respect that goes back and forth, and frustrations get high in this House. But uh, I keep thinking back to that, I, uh, the immeasurable sacrifices that went into self-governance. It would be a lot easier if we, I, I had a, a gentleman one time tell me, there's too many of you members of Congress, we should cut the numbers in half. And I said, why think so small? Get rid of all of us and just name a king, then you don't have to worry about this messy democracy. Well, that's not what Americans do. We understand that there's 435 opinions here, good opinions, differences, strong opinions for the right things about this country, but we disagree on how some of those things should get done. At the end of the day, those differences are a strength if we can get the glue that holds us together as a nation in the compromise. And I'll be the first to say, I, I certainly don't want to see this House capitulate its responsibility. But I also understand that at a time, there are certain realities of what can move and what cannot. And I think deadlines, like this motion to instruct puts in, puts that deadline solid and it asks us to come, what can we give? Many of the provisions my colleagues were, were talking about, whether it's Keystone Pipeline, I personally am supportive of that. And if it's in here, I think that's a good thing. But I understand a lot of my colleagues don't and there's no way the Senate does that. The American people have elected us. They've elected a Senate that doesn't agree with that. So at the end of the day, I have to make a choice, and all of us do. Is it worth holding up a highway bill over a piece of legislation that I personally like, but don't believe that it outpaces the point of getting these roads built. And so I think the public wants to see us do that. I certainly am willing to compromise, as my, uh, my friend from Tennessee has always proven to be, to try and get it right. And I think the public wants us to stand by our principles of trying to get it there. But uh, at the end of the day, something has to be done. Something has to move forward. The country depends on a workable infrastructure, and, and I can't tell you, in, in watching this happen, of seeing how important moving those products when the I-35W bridge was in the river, not just in terms of the loss of life, the tragedy that happened there, but the disruptions that happened also sprung out and, and rippled out into the economy. And I think all of us understand that tragic incident 
we don't want to see it replicated and we also know the smart investments prevent it from happening so uh, mr. speaker I am uh, appreciative of the members who came and spoke passionately tonight. I'm appreciative of the folks who understand that this deliberative body has to come to some type of resolution. I would urge my colleagues to support this motion to instruct, simply asking us, do the work we were sent here to do, get it done on time, and get America working and moving again. And with that, Mr. Speaker, uh, I yield back. All time having expired on this debate, without objection, the previous question is ordered. The question occurs on the motion to instruct. All those in favor will say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes appears to have it. Mr. Speaker, I request the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. A sufficient number having arisen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question are postponed. Lays before, the chair lays before the House the following personal request. Leave of absence requested for Mr. Miller of Florida for today, June 18, and for the balance of the week. Without objection, the request is granted. The chair will entertain requests for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I ask the House to address the House for one minute to provide Without objection. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, tonight we saw what's possible. When we come together and know that the good of the American public, their will, if it has worked in this House as it has for 236 years as we began to deliberate and try and move forward on what helps the American public, bringing in our differences, debating and at times passionately debating what we feel, but at the end of the day, understanding the ultimate goal is what strengthens and moves this country forward. And I think tonight, in seeing an agreement on a, a bipartisan motion to instruct, just asking us, let's do the public's work, get a transportation bill done, put people back to work, build our highways, bridges, and infrastructure necessary to move people safely back and forth, but also to move goods to compete in the 21st century. It's not that big a lift. We can do it in a safe, efficient, modern manner, and we can pay for it in a responsible way. The American public are willing to invest in America. They're simply asking us to do it smartly and do it in a way that compromises for the good of all. So with that, I'm incredibly proud, it always is, of this deliberative body. We have the ability to move it forward, and with that, I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Rhode Island seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our most pressing legislative items were nowhere to be seen on the House floor today. We had an opportunity to make headway on critical legislation, but Republicans have not provided action or solutions, only obstruction and delay. Student loan interest rates will double on July 1st if Congress does nothing. After losing an estimated 28,000 construction jobs last month, Congress still hasn't passed a highway bill. The Republican leadership in the House refuses to bring the bipartisan Senate transportation bill to the floor for a vote, even though it would support uh, one million construction jobs right away, including more than 8,000 in the state of Rhode Island. Our middle class families, our small businesses, our students, and our manufacturers deserve greater certainty so they can pl better plan their lives and companies, grow jobs, and strengthen our economy. Yet another day has passed without action to avoid sequestration or address expiring tax provisions or prevent a rise in costs for higher education. Instead, Republicans plan to waste more time this week with partisan anti-environment messaging bills with little, no, little or no hope of passage in the Senate and veto threats that have already been issued by the administration. We cannot let this become another wasted week. Our constituents deserve more. This Congress has to take action now, not delay until it's too late. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi, is recognized for 60 minutes as a designee of the Minority Leader.
Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, we have been engaged for this last hour in a discussion about what to do with one of the most important parts of America's public agenda, which is the transportation uh, systems of this nation. Uh, we've heard a lot of back and forth. We actually heard that there was some agreement uh, that we ought to get on with it. Indeed, we ought to get on with it. We ought to get a transportation bill before the American public, and we ought to get it to the president. Unfortunately, there is a gridlock and deadlock. Uh, behind all of the gentle rhetoric of the floor this evening, there are some profound differences in how we move forward with the transportation bill. We'll discuss some of those uh, as we journey through this one hour or some portion of this one hour. I think I'd like to start, oh, maybe more than 200 years ago. There's a lot of discussion. Uh, we often hear it uh, here on the floor and in the rhetoric across the nation that the Founding Fathers would do it this way or that way, and if we only listened to the Founding Fathers, uh, most of our problems would be resolved. Usually, uh, those discussions really speak to not doing something. Turns out that the Founding Fathers really did have a great deal of wisdom. I came across a book uh, written by Mr. Tom Hartman called uh, The American Dream. And in it, in his very first chapter, he goes back to the Founding Fathers. And he talks about what George Washington and George Washington's Secretary of Treasury actually did. On the day he was inaugurated, Mr. Washington said he did not want to wear a suit made in England. He wanted to wear something made in America. Well, the make it in America is one of the principal things that my colleagues and I on the Democratic side have been talking about for some time. So when I came across this book, I said, wow, this is interesting. George Washington instructed his Secretary of Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, to develop a manufacturing program for the United States. And Alexander Hamilton did that. He didn't uh, do it in two or 3,000 pages as we might do it today did it in just a short maybe 20 or 30 pages, and he developed an 11-point plan for Amanu America's manufacturers. Turns out that many of those 11 points are what we have been proposing on the Democratic side here for our Make It in America agenda. But tonight I wanted to pick up one of those 11 points, and it happens to be the 11th of the 11 points that Alexander Hamilton presented to George Washington in 1790, 1790, and it was on American manufacturers. So, point number 11, facilitating of the transportation of commodities. Uh, the language is uh, rather ancient English, but it still speaks to the following. Improvements favoring this objective intimately concern all domestic interests of a community, but they may, without impropriety, be mentioned as having an important relationship to manufacturers. There is perhaps scarcely anything which has been calculated to assist the manufacturers of Great Britain than the meritorious of public roads of that kingdom and the great progress which has been of late made in opening canals. Of the former, the United States stands much in need. He goes on to talk about the necessity for transportation here and copying what had gone on in Great Britain, that is, the development of public roads. The and he says, the following remarks are sufficiently judicious and pertinent to deserve a literal quotation. And then quotation, good roads, canals, and navigable rivers, by diminishing the expense of carriage put the remote parts of a country more nearly upon the level with those in the neighborhood of a town. They are, upon that account, the greatest of all improvements. So, here we are in Mr. Hartman's book, Rebooting the American Dream, talking about what the Founding Fathers wanted to do in 1790. I would also point out that by 1792, Nearly all of those 11 points had become law 
and laid the foundation for the great American Industrial Revolution. So back to infrastructure, the word we use today. We use infrastructure when we talk about our highways, our canals, our roads, and our transportation systems. Uh, there were, in fact, some public transportation systems at that time. Now, speaking specifically of roads and jobs, we often talk about jobs here. We need to understand that today, if we were to pass the Senate version of the highway transportation of the public transportation bills, we would put two million unemployed construction workers back to work this year. This year, two million would go back to work if we were to take up the Senate bill. Now, unfortunately, we've been in a gridlock and there's been no effort to compromise. My colleagues on the Republican side are demanding fundamental changes in the transportation systems and the way in which we apportion that money. Those changes have not been acceptable to the Senate, and indeed, those changes were not acceptable to even their own caucus. The Republican caucus was unable to reach agreement. They have more than enough votes to pass a bill out of this House, but they could not reach agreement among themselves, let alone with the Senate. And yet, they are demanding that the Senate take up what they could not agree to. On our side, we have simply said, let's go with the Senate bill. After all, 74 senators, both Democrats and Republicans, voted for it, leaving some 26 that chose not to support it. So, two million. Two million Americans are waiting for action by the House of Representatives and the Senate. Two million Americans want to go to work, and yet we have this deadlock. We just found some support amongst ourselves to tell the conferees, get it done by the end of this week or take up the Senate bill. Listening carefully to what we heard on the floor not more than an hour ago, compromise is not going to be found. Keystone Pipeline, no public transportation funding, eliminate the environmental protections that have been in place for more than 40 years, streamline, meaning eliminate programs. So compromise is not there. What has happened over the last several months? Well, while our Republican colleagues have been trying to get their own act together, here's what's happened to employment in the construction industry. Way back in January, some 5,570,000 5, Americans were working in the highway construction and public transportation construction sector. In May, that number had fallen to 5,510,000. 5, some 60,000 Americans lost their job while the Republicans were trying to figure out how they could come to an agreement with themselves on a transportation bill. They couldn't. 60,000 Americans, 60,000 families lost their ability to earn a living as the majority in this House failed to even agree amongst themselves on what to do. The Senate moved forward with a bill. It's been there nearly two months before this House available. A conference committee was formed and gridlock continues. 60,000 families are without an income as a result of the gridlock and the inability of our colleagues to come to an agreement. It's time for us to move on. It's time for us to put a two-year bill in place, as the Senate has proposed, one that would put two million Americans back to work immediately. States could move forward. States would know that over the next two years there would be funding from the federal government. Right now, the word from my friends on the other side of the aisle is, well, we're going to go with a 60-day extension. States cannot work with that. They don't know what would be available at the end of the 60 days. They don't know what's available today because we're up against a deadline. It's time for us 
to move with the Senate bill. It's time for us to end this continuing decline. This is May. If we were to take the June figures, which are now being unfortunately coming forward, more and more construction workers have lost their jobs. They are in my district. My contractors are saying there is no further contract available to us. We won't be able to put our people to work. We don't have a contract. The states can't offer new contracts. So it won't be just 60,000. At the end of June, it'll probably be 70 or 75,000 or perhaps even more that have lost their job as this gridlock continues here in the House of Representatives. We can do better. We can, can do better. How important is this to the economy? It's very important to the economy. Not just the construction workers, not just their families, the two million that could go to work if we accepted the Senate bill. And it's a good bill. It provides adequate funding for transportation, for repairing the bridges that we heard so much discussion of, for paving the roads that we heard so much discussion of just less than an hour ago, of providing the money for the public transportation sector so that the buses, the trains, the planes can continue to operate. It's a good bill. Not perfect, not as large as many would want, doesn't have the Keystone Pipeline in it, doesn't eviscerate the environmental uh, protections that are necessary as we build these projects. So what would happen if we were to accept the Senate bill, end the gridlock, put two million Americans back to work, end the decline? Well, here's it is. For every dollar that we invest in, trans in infrastructure, that's the highway bill and the transportation bill, $1.57 is pumped into the American economy. That comes from Mark Zandi, chief economist for Moody Analyst Analytics. Spend a dollar on transportation and you increase the GDP, you increase the economic activity of this nation by a dollar and fifty seven cents. So there's more than just transportation at stake here. What's at stake here as we see the continuing decline of the transportation and construction sector as a result of the gridlock that's been with us nearly this entire year. What's at stake is the growth of the American economy. It's the grocery store that will have a customer coming in, not spending an unemployment check, but rather spending a check that's given to them by the contractor. And that money circulates in the economy so that the hairdresser, the barber, maybe even the gun shop owner, will see their business increase 57 percent. For every dollar spent, a dollar and 57 cents is generated in the economy, putting other people to work beyond the construction industry. Now, there's more to it than that. One of the provisions that we would like to see in the bill, which actually is in the Senate bill, is a tightening of the waivers that have been so injurious, injurious to the American economy. The waivers that have been overused in the last two decades, waivers that push aside the buy it in America provisions that we presently have in the law, push those aside and say, we don't care whether that money is spent on American made equipment. We don't care whether that money is spent on jobs in America, just pushing aside the Buy America provisions. The Senate bill has a very important provision that will create even more jobs in America because it tightens up, tightens up the waiver provisions and says to the Department of Transportation, no, you cannot just willy-nilly provide a waiver. You must adhere to the law that says buy America, 60% minimum American content 
in the steel in the bridge that's going to be repaired, in the asphalt and concrete that's going to be laid over the roads. Minimum 60% content on the buses and the trains that are going to be paid for with your tax dollars. What that means is make it in America. That provision that is in the Senate bill will enhance American manufacturing by limiting the waivers that have been so numerous over the last two decades as to hollow out the American manufacturing sector. Manufacturing matters. This is the American middle class, the construction industry and the manufacturing industry is the heart and the soul and the foundation of America's middle class. And so in the Senate bill, it tightens up the waiver provisions and says that Americans will have the jobs, not some foreign employee of a company that has gained the contract. I want to give you a specific example. In California, the largest public works project ever is the reconstruction of the, and the rebuilding of the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, a new bridge, billions of dollars. The steel in that bridge was made in China. 6,000 jobs in China, no jobs in America. Said to be 10% cheaper. Turned out that at the outset, the Chinese steel manufacturers could not produce the steel. But they got the contract, and what they did was to figure out how to produce the steel. They built a new steel mill, 6,000 jobs. In America, no. In China, yes. Turned out that the steel was not 10% cheaper. It was shoddy. The welds were not adequate. They had to go back. Delays occurred. Turned out to be even more expensive. Had that occurred in America, those, that new steel mill would have been built in America. And it would be there for the next contract, the next bridge to be built in America or around the world. But oh no, we're going to save 10%. We lost American jobs. If the Senate bill were to come to this floor and become law, the waiver that was allowed and given to the state of California, a waiver that allowed the Chinese steel company to have the contract, would not have been allowed. 6,000 jobs would have been in America. And we would once again make it in America. And Americans would make it. But oh no, it didn't happen. Manufacturing matters. I'd like to see another provision in the bill, but I won't demand this. And my Democratic colleagues who support this are not going to demand it because we want to get on with providing those two million jobs for American workers in the construction industry. But let me take a moment to explain what it is. This is a bill that I introduced at the beginning of this year's, uh, beginning of last year. It's H.R. 613. And what it says is that our tax money, the money that is being spent by every American when they buy a gallon of gasoline or a gallon of diesel, that that money goes into the Highway Trust Fund, and 613 says it must be spent on American-made equipment. Highways. This is the steel that's on the bridges. This is the rebar that's in the roads. This is the concrete, the asphalt, American-made. If you want to build a high-speed rail, as we do in California, then that high-speed rail is going to be financed with your tax dollars, and it will be American-made high-speed rail train. You want a train? You want to improve your transit system? It'll be American-made. Is it possible? Does this work? Let me give you an example. In the American Recovery Act, sometimes known as the Stimulus Bill, there was a provision for Amtrak trains. Upgrade the Amtrak system. I think it was a little over $12 billion. Some wise staffer wrote next to that $12 billion a sentence that said, this money must be spent on American-made equipment. 100% American-made equipment. 
Oh, you can't do that. Well, it turns out that you can do that. A German company, one of the largest industrial companies in the world, looked at it and said, 12 billion? Hmm. We can build it in America. And they did. They built a manufacturing plant in Sacramento, California, and they are producing 100% American-made locomotives because the law said that it must be done. H.R. 613 says precisely that. If you want to spend our tax, if you want the tax money, then it must be American-made equipment. Use our tax dollars to create American-made jobs. Not steel made in China, not trains made in Germany, not locomotives from Japan. It's our tax money. It will be spent on American-made equipment. That's what this does. And we have the proof that it can be done. It's being done today in Sacramento, California, by Siemens, a German company that built a manufacturing plant to take advantage of money that was available if the product was made in America. Another sad example, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, BART, needs to replace its 40-year-old trains. $3.2 billion. The minimum in the law today is 60%. The bids went out. Two bidders were in the finals. One, a French company, Alstom. Another, a Canadian company, Bombardier. Bombardier's bid was 2 3% lower than Alstom's. However, there was a significant difference. Bombardier said, we will build 66% American content. Alstom, the French company, said, we can do better. A little bit higher price. We can do better. We will build 95% American content. The difference, a billion dollars of American jobs. 66%, 95%. 2%, difference in price. The BART Board of Directors refused to go back to a second bidding process that would have taken 60 or 90 days. Alstom said, we'll cut our price. We want these jobs in America. It turns out most of them be New York, not California. We want these jobs in America. Go back to another round of bidding, and we'll get out a sharp pencil, and we'll come down. The BART Board of Directors let that opportunity for a billion dollars of jobs to go by. Many of us believe that Alstom would have matched or even outperformed the Bombardier bid, or maybe Bombardier would come back and say, okay, we'll go to 95%. We don't know. We'll never know. But what we do know is that a billion dollars of American jobs were lost. So now as we continue to debate and dally and let time go by, as American jobs, as American workers, as American workers in the construction industry see the continued decline month by month, in the, lay in the number of men and women that are employed as the layoffs continue. Between January and May, more than 60,000 construction workers in the United States have lost their jobs while we continue to fight over issues here. But the fundamental issue is the issue of jobs. You know, you can talk about the Keystone Pipeline and there are jobs there. And maybe someday that pipeline will be built. You can talk about the environmental processes that have protected the environment of this nation for the last 40 years, and maybe there ought to be some adjustments there. You can talk about giving states the power, which basically means there is no money set aside for public transportation. We can talk about those things. But as, you, as we wrestle back and forth for what one or another of us think is so critically important every day, Another construction worker has lost their job. Another family has lost their opportunity to make the payment on their home. Another community has seen the economy in their area diminish. We have a 
reasonably good bill available to us. We could vote on it tomorrow. That's the Senate bill. Protects American jobs. Protects the public transportation system. Is fully funded, not with some hypothetical money that may come in someday, but rather real dollars. It says that our tax dollars must be spent on American-made equipment, on American jobs. It's a good bill. We had a motion to instruct here on the floor just a few moments ago. And as you listen to the debate, you think there was agreement. And there is agreement. We've got to get this job done. We've got to put Americans back to work. Two million Americans await our decision. Are we going to continue to fight for some perceived issue that is important to a small group of people? Are we going to look at the larger, comp the larger picture here, the picture of American workers, of American jobs? We'll know. I suppose tomorrow we'll take up that motion to instruct. And we'll see if by the end of this week we're willing to compromise. Are we willing to put Americans back to work, two million Americans? Or are we going to hold fast to perhaps a funding scheme that's been proposed and can't even be agreed to by the members of the Republican caucus? Or an elimination of certain categories of funding like public transportation, which couldn't even be agreed to by the Republican caucus, let alone the Democrats. It's time to look at the bigger picture. It's time to look at that construction worker in our community, the ones we represent, and say, I want you to go back to work. We'll fight this out another day. But the most fundamental and most important issue confronting this American economy and each and every individual in America is where are the jobs? Where is my job? How can I support my family? It's time to put the bickering aside. It's time to accept the fact that Americans want to go to work and two million Americans are out there looking for their opportunity. And their opportunity rests with us, rests with the House of Representatives. The Senate has done its work. It's put a two-year fully funded transportation bill that meets the needs of this nation for the next two years. They passed it out. This House has not passed a transportation bill. We put a stopgap thing out so we can go to Congress. But it wasn't a transportation bill. It didn't do the job. Maybe Wednesday, Thursday, or maybe sometime Friday, there can be an agreement between the two houses. But if there is not an agreement, then, as I heard not more than an hour ago from my Republican colleagues, in agreeing to the motion to instruct, that if there is no agreement, then take up the Senate bill. That was, in fact, the motion. Take up the Senate bill if there is no agreement. Put two million Americans back to work. Repair our highways. Repair our bridges. Buy American. Enhance the Buy American provisions. We've got work to do. Americans have work to do. Americans want to work. And it's time for this House to work. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back.